I feel like it wasn't too long ago when anime was treated as this separate medium, with purity tests that could be charitably described as unreasonable. Well, this has led to other problems. I'll take the victories where I can. Let's get to it. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. The concept of an anime RPG is in a weird place, as I said last month. In my early days with the hobby, anime was treated as this separate thing, almost ghettoized from the rest of the tabletop world. Okay, that might be a little hyperbolic, but there was this attitude that being anime-inspired was some mark of shame by a lot of traditionalists. I think that's why the attempts at anime tabletop RPGs we're always pivoting towards universal-style play, in the same way that cartoons are seen as a genre by some. Much to my own annoyance, personally. But the largest example of this was always Big Eyes, Small Mouth. Now, since everything old is new again, we now have a fourth edition of this flag bearer of the concept of an anime tabletop. But with this new release, I felt it prudent to explore what the appeal is with this strange and wondrous medium from Japan. But that question is better served by an expert in the field, so I'll defer to my good brother Shades on this one. Have at it, my friend. Thanks, Monk. Obviously, the fact that anime has become such a popular medium and remained that way for so long means there has to be something about it that stands out amongst other forms of visual entertainment. So what is that? Of course, it comes down to many factors, but in my opinion, the biggest of these is a willingness to take advantage of its lack of limitations. Being an animated medium, the only limits one can truly have is one's imagination. Yet for decades in the US, animation was only ever seen as a medium for children, or at the very least for comedy. Sure, there have been shows that push the boundaries of what a cartoon was, like a lot of the 90s superhero cartoons, and more mature humor has been slipped into shows like Animaniacs or many Disney films, but at the end of the day, it was never taken seriously as an art form. In Japan, however, they have strived to use the freedom of imagination and have made just about every kind of show you can think of in anime. From serious dramas to tear-jerking romance, intense action, spine-tingling horror, and yes, even silly comedy. Mixing and matching these genres to make something completely new at times. Hell, they've even dabbled in more risque ventures with their own levels of variety. And while they do target teens more often than not outside of the risque stuff, they never limit themselves to just that audience. It's this lack of restraint that we find so fascinating with anime. We constantly ask ourselves, what could they come up with next? Combine that with Japan's already unique, interesting, and often to us, weird culture and history, and you have a medium that is unlike anything else out there. Many have tried to replicate it, but few, if any, can truly capture that pure, raw, unrestrained imagination that anime can provide. Back to you, Monk. Thank you, Shades. It's in this variety that an anime RPG has an uphill battle, not just with the sheer variety of genres, but with also making sure to not fall into the trap of being a full-on universal game like Hero or GURPS. Big Eye's Small Mouth was always going to be borderline on this. For example, its first edition wasn't exactly close to the universal pitfall, but it was vague in other ways. Almost like a diceless game that got hacked into a dice game. Second edition was far more in the middle ground, and a third edition was a little too close to GURPS in several ways. But now, after a decade, Big Eyes Small Mouth returns with a new edition. Does it aim high, or does it land low? Let's find out. Big Eyes Small Mouth, or for the purposes of this, BESM, 4th edition runs at 354 pages, making it slightly larger than 3rd edition, but I'd owe that to a larger text size. The pages are far more colorful than previous editions, which might be a little too garish for some, but I liked its bright atmosphere. There's plenty of new art as well, along with some reused art from past editions. This does create a bit of a clash, as one might expect when using art that's a decade old, but the clash isn't as bad as it could be. That said, I do need to comment on something exclusive to the PDF version that I have. The bookmarks here are a little... spotty. And I took some time modifying my copy to expand on the bookmarks that weren't listed to make things easier for me. 
Not to say the book's hard to navigate, but it's one of my pet peeves. At least the index still works. Character creation is a point-by affair, rooted in power level and total points to spend. We'll be exploring this with a samurai-esque character in Ryuzoji Kaito Fujiwara, because I feel like making a deep-cut throwback to my early days. After all, everything old is new again. The first step is to determine a power level, effectively a range of points to spend on. We'll go with the heroic tier and start with a point budget of 85. Step 2 is stats. Each of your three main stats costs 2 points per level. We'll assign a level of 8 for body, 5 for mind, and 6 for soul. Step 3 is the largest step with attributes and defects. These are going to be the crux of point spending in character creation and range from skills, equipment, personality traits, and special actions. Each of these are leveled based on how they'll impact play, with variable costs throughout. In addition, attributes may have limiters attached to them, increasing their level but focusing their spheres of influence. For attributes, we'll go with the following. Combat Technique 4, Extra Actions 1, Gear 1, Heightened Awareness 4, Inspire 3, 3 points in his katana as an item, Massive Damage 3 with a Sword Focus, Melee Attack and Defense 4, the Adventuring Artistic, Domestic, and Social Skill Groups at 2 each, Special Movement 1, and Tough 2. For Defects, we'll take minus 1 in Social Fault, minus 4 in Cursed, and minus 2 in Wanted. Lastly, Derived Statistics. This also determines our derived stats. So we have 70 Health Points, 55 Energy Points, a damage multiplier of 5, and a combat value of 22. Character creation is still crunchy, but it has been smoothed out in other ways. Now, I like the use of enhancements and limiters affecting the effective level instead of the point cost. That goes a long way towards lessening the main issue games like this can have. That said, one can only do that so much with these kind of games that are so freeform. It will be crunchy to some form or another, and there's little that'll change that. Because of that, it's going to have the issue of choice paralysis, as the gap between freestyle creation and template-based creation is still fairly wide. Now, I don't like this one-page character sheet, though. Perhaps I should have used the folio version, but this needed a lot more than just one page, given the details of several attributes. Not bad, but there's a few nitpicks. BESM continues to use the Tristat system in its 4th edition. This is a roll-high 2d6 system, where the roll is added to the relevant stat along with any modifiers and compared to a target number to determine success or failure. The biggest change in this edition is the inclusion of edges and obstacles, which I've seen some compare to the advantage-disadvantage mechanic in D&D 5th edition. However, I'd say that here there's a more consistent bell curve. Anyways, these are split between minor and major, which add 1 or 2 d6s to the roll, keeping the highest 2 or lowest 2 respectively. It's a nice alternative to the plus-minus modifiers from 3rd edition, and at the very least here there's enough choice not to treat the effect as crutch. It's interesting how shock value is out in this edition, which acted as a kind of stun threshold in the past. Now, I can see how this removal could streamline play, but I wouldn't be opposed to keeping it as a means of discouraging tanking. That said, the multiplier is something I could see getting out of hand quickly in combat. BESM doesn't have an extra effort mechanic in the traditional sense, but a character's energy point pool can act as a rough equivalent by granting a plus one bonus for every ten energy points spent. I may have had some issues with the roll high approach with 3rd edition, but I don't have as much persuasion to have those issues here as it's better integrated. The Tristat system at play here definitely provides an effective base, but the operative word here is base. I think some form of spicing up of the dice could go a long way to help the risk of rolling dice actually matter. I'm not saying box cars and snake eyes should be auto success and failure, but I'd like to see something extra happen based on the dice roll. I don't know, maybe that's being saved for extras. Big Eye's Small Mouth in this 4th edition has gone a long way to smooth out some of the kinks that were in 2nd and 3rd, making play that eases up on the hiccups of its predecessor. Now I'm still on the fence about the anime multiverse idea, but if it's going to be its own book, then I'm a little more accepting. As I mentioned before, being a point-by game, it's going to be a double-edged sword no matter what. And even with the changes there, 
That's a wall that'll be too daunting for some to climb. For those folk, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the slimmed down version of the game known as BESM Naked, that is more comparable to rules light games than BESM 4th Edition Core is. There's also the matter of its anime ness. While it's not quite as GURPS esque as 3rd Edition was, there's still the fact that it's a sandbox game in an age where people prefer focusing on specific genres. I hope this is something that's addressed in specific books in a manner similar to where it did previously, especially with 2nd edition. With that said, I hinted at comparing this to the flag bearer that was OVA, so I may as well fire off that Chekhov's gun. I'd say that Naked has more in common with OVA than the core 4th edition does, but this is definitely going to lean more in favor of those who prefer structure in their experience as opposed to the zero rule OVA operated under. With all that said, Big Eyes Small Mouth 4th Edition gets a stamp of strongly recommended. I may have some shortcomings with the dice rolls, but there's a strong foundation here. Now that key word is foundation. I am fully aware that my position might change based on how the game gets supported. I'll be keeping a close eye on extras and multiverse when they come around, and they may even play a factor into my rating. 4th Edition is an effective first step but I feel it's got time to grow into its true potential. Whether it manages to reach that goal, well, that's something for the next episode.